Hi, um, my name is Richard Walansky. Um, I see some familiar faces in the audience, um, and hopefully some shareholders. And I'm the Finance Director of Ovation PLC. Um, look, firstly, thank you very much for your time. Um, I think this is the last presentation. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. And I promise there's some alcohol outside waiting for you, I think, that they're sitting, I saw them sitting up just before I walked in. Um, Ovation is an aircraft lessor. That is, we own a fleet of aircraft and we lease them to airlines for the long term. So we simply own a portfolio of assets and we collect rents on them from airlines. Typically in aircraft leasing, um, and, our, and, and typical of our business model, we like to own brand new or young aircraft, and you'll sign a lease on an aircraft with an airline that will last for 10 to 12 years. That's the business model. So um, what I hope to do over the next 20 minutes or so is just give you a bit of background and explain the business model in a little bit more detail, take you through the event, the, the significant event that happened this year that has enabled us to expand our fleet significantly this year, which is the reason why you actually want to hear this story today, because we've added uh, a number of planes to the fleet, and that is going to uh, result in significant increases in revenue in 2017. <coughs> and then I'll just give you a, a bit about what we're sort of going to do um, in 2017 and beyond. There is a, uh, there is a copy of this presentation um, outside in the room next to the glasses of wine. There's also some research from our, our new appointed broker, Stiefel, um, which uh, have only come on board in the last couple of uh, months. So that's brand new research. It's normally pretty hard to get. And so just to be, um, just to be clear, we've been around for about 10 years. We've been profitable the whole time. Um, and we've typically doubled in size every two and a half or so years. So we're a company that's generating significant revenue, has significant revenue growth, and has been profitable in its entire history. So the company was set up in Western Australia just by starting off with a couple of planes. Um, and our story is one of um, evolution and maturity. Um, it was set up by the founder, um, Jeff Chatfield, who ran a small West Australian airline. Uh, that airline was bought by Virgin Australia, and this business started supplying uh, aircraft to a national carrier. So we expanded the business in, in the first instance. At that point in time, we um, were the first uh, company in, the, in Australia to introduce that aircraft, which is our niche and specialty aircraft. We have, as of today, I think 24 of those aircraft, because we delivered our 24th yesterday. And they make up about half our balance sheet. So we've got a mixture of those turboprops and jets. The turboprop aircraft that you see there is an ATR-72. Now it's a regional aircraft, it's a short haul aircraft. It's an aircraft that specialises in just flying three or 400 or 500 nautical miles. It is a class leader and it outsells its competitors at seven to one. And that is because over those distances, it uses about half the fuel per seat per hour of an equivalent size jet. So it's an extremely profitable aircraft for airlines to run. We since, when, we, when we, we started introducing that ATR to Australia with Virgin Australia, ATR really liked us for doing that. We uh, introduced over a dozen planes really quickly. And they gave us a bunch of forward delivery options and said, go and market these planes to the world. And in fact, lessors um, end up owning half of the annual production of aircraft every year, which is about 1,500 aircraft of all types, jets and turboprops, worth $150 billion. So lessors are very much a shop front for companies like Boeing and Airbus. We place their product. And so they said, go and do that. And that's what we did. We, we uh, found airlines around the world over the last three or four years, and we've steadily and rapidly grown our fleet, and we've uh, more than doubled our fleet in the last two years. And we've got uh, air, air, airline and aircraft executives. Um, Rod Mahoney, who's our chief sales guy, worked for Airbus for 25 years. Russell Hubbard, who is a trader, um, has bought and sold aircraft for over 25 years. Uh, and I'm a finance guy. The most important thing to appreciate about this company, we're listed on the London Stock Exchange. It's a standard listing. We've been there for over six years. And the share price has gone from 4p to, I think it's a pound 44, pound 45 today. 
And that's just through growth in revenues and, and consistent profitability and doing the same thing, which is just adding planes to the fleet to give you lots of visibility about how we're going to grow revenues and, and earnings in the future. But we own 22% of the company. And if you download our annual report, you'll see that nobody in this company earns millions of dollars of salaries. You know, our reward is tied into the share price of the company. And what we're trying to do, and, what, and we only have 17 people, so we're running a, 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 a big fleet of aircraft with just 17 people, is that what we're trying to do is grow the share price. And so our interests are, I think, directly aligned with shareholders. So a snapshot of us. We're based in Singapore, and everybody works and lives in Singapore. I obviously travel a lot to London because our listing is here. Been listed for six years. We have a, a, a particular focus on only certain types of aircraft. Obviously, there's that turboprop, which is very successful in its, sec in, you know, in, in its sector, which is regional travel. And we only deal in jets that are most popular types of jets, the jets that every airline uses. We don't deal in the big wide bodies, the really expensive planes. We deal in, and that's because those narrow body jets, the type that EasyJet and Ryanair use, are used by all the world's airlines. And I'm sure the best analogy for, for our business, <coughs> it, it, for those who haven't heard it and those who have heard this speech before will have heard me give this analogy before, it's like buying a flat to let, in, this, uh, in, in which case the asset, instead of being an apartment, is an aircraft. We use bank debt to buy that aircraft. And our big job and our, the big success in what we can do is to find an airline who is a tenant and then they just pay us rent for 10 or 12 years. And that's why it's a little bit different to a property investment, is that a typical lease is 10 or 12 years. And the other major difference is that aircraft generate four or five times the yield that a property investment. And there it is there. Our lease yield, the average across all 38 aircraft, because this slide is a couple of days old now, and we delivered, as I said, we delivered our 38th aircraft yesterday, but the average yield on all of those assets, and there are over $700 million of assets, is what we own, is 13.4%. And the average age of the 38 planes is under four and a half years old. Planes live for 25 years, so they can produce income for at least 25 years. And the average lease that's attached to all 38 aircraft is almost seven years. So that's lots of visibility. So if you multiply, $700 million by 13% times by seven years, that's our contracted revenue for the next seven years. So lots of visibility for, for, for investors. And those metrics are some of the best in the business as well. And all that we've been doing is just adding more and more aircraft. We haven't tried to expand or do anything different in, in any time in our history. The reason why we deal in the most popular types of aircraft, by the way, is the worst thing that can happen to us is an, air, an airline customer or airline tenant, our tenant goes bust, or your tenant, say your tenant loses your job and loses their job and stops paying rent on your apartment. It's a bad thing to happen. The beauty of, of, of our business is that these are mobile assets and we can go pick our asset up. The reason why we choose the most popular types of aircraft is that we can then put that aircraft to work in one of the other 200 or 250 airlines in the world that use these most popular assets. So we typically only like Boeing and Airbus products or aircraft because they, they're responsible for the manufacture of 95% of the world's aircraft. So Embraer, we're not really that interested in. It's too exotic for us. And that's also part of the reason why we don't deal in the big stuff because there's a lot smaller numbers of the big stuff. We're trying to get scale and diversification. Build up our fleet and get economies of scale. So there, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, and because the presentation is outside, I'll skip a couple of slides quite, quite quickly for the sake of time and getting you all a refreshing drink. But we've just got a consistent history of doing the same thing and, and, and growing the fleet, growing income and growing earnings. So a bit about the industry, and, and most people are unaware of this, but every second aircraft in the world is owned by a lessor. Most people think that if it's got British Airways painted on the tail, it's owned by British Airways. That's not true. And British Airways rents planes from companies like us. We don't have any with... I've got a list of customers that I'll show you later on. But every, virtually every airline in the world 
rents part or all of its fleet. Uh, and we're intrinsic in that process. And just like with the property analogy, you go and borrow money from a bank to buy an apartment, well, airlines come to lessors to be able to get access to new aircraft. And so what's driving this? What, why is our business so successful? Because our business is extremely successful. Include, in, in fact, the whole industry is, is successful. It all is driven by passenger growth and people flying more each year. And it's, about, it's over 6% a year and has been that way for 50 years. Um, what the airlines have done really successfully over the last 20 years is um, move um, air travel from being a luxury item to being accessible to the middle class. And now with business models like Ryanair, and, I, and we also see this a lot in Asia, um, they're actually enabling uh, the lower socioeconomic groups to buy really cheap tickets and fill the planes. And they're making money. They're, they're very profitable. Ryanair is very profitable. And that's, and that's what's driving the passenger growth. If you open up these big um, socioeconomic groups and allow a lot more people to fly, you keep driving this demand for, for, for airline tickets. And on top of that, what the, what, by the use of technology, and the, 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 the key technology is one of these, you know, 10 years ago, you'd waltz down the high street to buy your air tickets. You know, I could book a flight now and fly out, fly out of this country by midnight, just about. Now, that's how much technology has improved the ability for airlines to get bums on seats. And that's all that our, that's all that our business is driven by. And on top of that, everyone knows, obviously, there's, a, there's been a, a huge drop in the price of oil. And so airlines have got this trifecta, and I think they're going to have a golden few years of success. Why is that important for us? Well, one, um, they're growing their fleets, people are, uh, people are doing OK, they're buying more planes. But most importantly, you know, we're all out, the risk of our company is the credit risk of all our customer airlines. So if they're all doing better and they're all more profitable, that means we have less risk as a company and we're a better company and we're a better investment, in fact. So last year was a record that, uh, profitability year and record profit margin for the airline business and they doubled profitability. They'll probably do the same again this year. So that's passenger traffic you know, um, growing by about 6% a year. And it doesn't matter what big event or big shock happens, global shock, whether it be going back 15 years to 9-11 or going back a year ago to the, plane, the Russian plane that was shot, blown up over Egypt, the health scares of Ebola last year or the SARS virus 12 years ago, the GFC seven years ago or the Asian debt crisis 12 years ago. All of these things were going to impact airline travel negatively but yet consistently and resiliently people just want to travel. Business is done face to face. People want to take their families on holidays every year somewhere else. You all know it yourself. Airports are full. Airplanes are full. That's great for our business. <coughs> In terms of what we don't do is that we're just portfolio managers. We have 38 assets that generate rent. So we choose those assets very, very carefully. Um, we, we focus on Asia, Pacific and Europe. We don't like Africa. We don't like Russia. We don't like places where they might point a gun at you if you go to collect your plane. We like places that respect the rule of law to enable us to go pick up our asset if there's a problem. So simple things like that. It's about risk mitigation because we are running $700 million worth of assets. And, you know, our, you know in all likelihood, that, um, the total in assets might grow to a billion dollars of assets under management by Christmas. This is fleet assets. This is just by adding more planes to the fleet. We're the second largest lessor of, the, of that ATR turboprop. So we're a big fish in that small pond. And that aircraft is used by 200 of the 250 airlines in the world. So it gets us an introduction and it's built our reputation. As I said before, we don't do wide body aircraft and we don't have orders going out for 10 years for hundreds of millions of dollars of aircraft. You know, we get our aircraft positioned and, um, and don't speculate too much. So here's, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but. This is the type of thing um, that explains our business model and also some of our risk mitigants. We like, as I said, brand new or young planes and we like to put 10 or 12 year leases on them. Now think about this. If we're yielding 13.5% on, on, on an aircraft and that lease goes for 10 years, well in 10 years you get 130% back of what you paid for that plane. So planes pay themselves off 
inside that first lease after about 10 or 11 years. That's even including the interest on the debt you, you know, borrowed to buy that plane. And so our business model is to pay our planes off halfway through their lives and they just produce free cash after that and they're profitable the whole way through. So we look for high lease rates, um, we write very strong leases, we uh, like the rule of law as I said and we do lots of analysis on the credit risk of our airlines. This is the, the business model explained quite simply in another way and we're just about done actually. When we buy the plane on day one, we use bank debt and we can borrow bank debt at between 3 and 4%. But this is on an asset that's yielding 13.5%. So we're a net margin business. You know, we, you know, we, we pay for it you know, at 3.5% and in fact across our 38 planes, the average cost of debt across the whole fleet is 4.8%. Which I'm about to explain to you the, the, the third point that I said about why, what's happened in the last year that's enabled us to grow our fleet so significantly and why this is a good time to hear about it as a potential investor. The hard thing in our business has always been able to fund that non-bank debt portion. And a year ago, um, in May in fact, so less than a year ago, we went and, um, and borrowed $100 million unsecured. And what we're doing with that $100 million unsecured is uh, using a bit of it for each of the new planes that we've got coming on to pay this portion. We're still getting the cheap senior bank debt. And because it's just paying that sort of top 20% or 25%, we can leverage that $100 million with about $300 million of senior bank debt and go out and buy $400 million worth of planes. Well, guess what? We've delivered nine planes this year. That's almost a plane a month. And I think it's about $275 million worth of planes we've added to our fleet this year. So we started the year with $430 million worth of planes, one July. And then we've added $275 million worth of planes in just those nine additions. That's the significance in growth. And the reason why you want to hear about this today is that take the plane that we delivered yesterday. It's sitting on our balance sheet. We've gone and got the debt. It's all locked away, the contract's signed, we set and forget about it now. You know, we just collect our rent every month. And remember, our, we don't do the maintenance and we don't pay for the insurance. We just collect 38 rent checks a month. It's as simple as our business is. But that plane that we added yesterday, and the other nine planes are, are also similar to this, it's only going to, our, our financial year end is 30 June. So it's only going to produce revenue for May and June. That's going to, you're going to see on the P&L. So 2016, in which we've added you know, these nine planes, you're not going to see the full benefit of the revenue in 2016. It's 2017 that you see that. And if you grab the research that's available outside, you see a big jump in our revenues. And these are contracted revenues. Because all these planes we're adding in 2017 get to produce a full year's revenue. So that's about it. The, the, the only point to add in terms of our half year, if you look at our results closely, is that by going and getting that, that unsecured money and then taking the nine months to deliver the planes, we had a bit of an interest expense um, that's um, impacted our half year results to 31 December. So our profit went down. But that was just because you know, we had to go and get $100 million. We couldn't get any less from the high yield bond markets. And then we had to wait for these planes to be delivered. And it's taken us nine months to do that. But, just to give you a, a, an idea of how it's changed the company, in the first half of the year we generated $31 million worth of revenue. We're going to generate about $40 million of revenue in the second half of the year because of these extra nine planes. So that's how much growth we're adding so rapidly. So just to finish off, there's a list of our customers. A lot of them have been added in the last year. We've doubled the number of customers we've got. We're, so we're diversifying our sources of revenue. At names that we've added that you know in recent times, Air France, Air Berlin, uh, Flyby, Scandinavian Airlines Services. So that's our fleet of um, 37 aircraft. As I said, the, on the top line there, one of those ordered 10 aircraft has now moved across into the fleet as of yesterday and we've got 38 planes. Our fleet has remained young and our leases have remained um, over the long term in our history. So we're, we're growing this company very carefully and choosing the right assets. And that's the big leap in growth that we've got this year um, shown in terms of 
um, the, the, the real inflection point that, that we've been through this year. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for your time. We've got a young fleet that's producing great revenue and earnings right now. We've been through the inflection point and we've taken the, the hit from the interest expense in the half year. But we've now, you know, even in what we've added this year, it's about $30 million of annualised revenue just with the nine planes that we've added this year. So we've got lots of uh, opportunity for growth in the future, consistent history of managing growth and profitability. Um, and 2017 is looking to be a very good year for us. And it's only a couple of, couple of months away. So thank you very much for your time. And, and I'm sure all the participants and speakers would like to thank you for your time and attendance as well. Time for questions. Gentlemen down here. Gen oh, lots of hands. A, a couple of linked questions. Um, what break causes do your contracts have with the customers? Yeah. And uh, what's the maximum... Uh, what, what's the biggest proportion of your fleet that you've got with one customer? Right, OK. The break clauses are that they have to go bust to stop paying our rent. It's, it's called hell and high water leases. Um, they're at, at fixed rates over the entire time. So, you know, an ATR, that turboprop, might generate $200,000 a month rent. That's $200,000 for up to 12 years. And importantly for you to know, because obviously if we're leveraged and we're using bank debt to borrow, um, to buy that plane, we fix our interest rates and over 95% of our entire debt is fixed. And so that's why I say set and forget because our debt would be over the 12 years, uh, which is equivalent to the lease. If we get a 10-year lease, we'll get a 10-year bit of debt. So it does, there's no overhang there. So we try to mitigate risk all along the way. But the airline literally has to go bust to stop paying, to, to, to stop paying our rent. In terms of concentration, our biggest customer is effectively um, uh, Virgin Australia. Um, it's a really good question and part of this inflection point and the adding of scale on all of these new planes is that a few years ago Virgin represented over 75% of our revenue. Now they represent less than 40% and that's quickly um, dropping down as we add more scale and diversification. We want revenue sources from lots of different airlines in case we have a problem with one of them. Thank you. Gentleman at the very back. Sorry. <coughs> Can you say something about the cost of aircraft, bearing in mind that world demand is increasing? Yeah, the co look, the cost of aircraft, um, the, it's, it's really just driven by um, supply and demand. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the cost of aircraft and that supply um, issue is that Boeing and Airbus have an effective duopoly. And you, if you know anything about the industry, you'll know that um, uh, backlogs for aircraft have grown from three years to almost six years for key Boeing and Air. And so they've been able to effectively control pricing to a certain extent. They're not cut, stabbing each other in the back. Um, pricing of aircraft has grown consistently. But yet, because of that same shortage in you know, the excess of demand for aircraft over supply, means that the aircraft that we've got access to, we can generate high <coughs> lease yields from. That's why, you know, that's why our lease, you know, that's why. The best way to think about our business is, as I said, if we're, just, you know, we're a leveraged business, so you look at the lease yield, 13.5%, less our average cost of debt, because that's our two main P&L, you know, that's the two main p &L items, which is 4.8%. So it's about that 8% net uh, margin. And that's only driven by the fact that we deal in most popular types of planes that all the airlines want, and we've got access to them. And so what we're seeing is that I think Boeing and Airbus are being smart. They don't want to produce planes that have no customers and aren't used by any airlines. And so they've let these backlogs grow by the, in the last couple of years. Neil? Richard, just to thank you for the presentation. A very general question on the whole industry. With such attractive spreads yeah. on borrowing against the yields that you're achieving, uh, and I understand it's a slightly specialist area, but why do, why do the banks not just deal directly with the airlines on this if it's such a profitable uh, area? Yeah, oh look, I mean, most of our people are airline people. It's a very small industry. There are only 250 airlines in the world, and so we like to do business with each other. But effectively, banks were in this business, but they've never failed to do it very well. The best example I can give you is a, there was a famous um, uh, air, airline failure in India called Kingfisher, billion, billionaire who created Kingfisher beer. As billionaires are want to do, he started his own airline, um, and it failed. Now, a lot of his uh, aircraft were leased, half were with banks and half were with lessors. On the day that that company failed, all the lessors came in and flew their aircraft out and put those assets to work elsewhere. 
the bank started negotiating with receivers and there's a long history that you can look up yourself that, that, that shows that those planes ended up getting pirated, parted out, effectively stolen. So the, you know, the assets which, are, which represent our security and are our assets um, are better dealt with by focused asset managers. Banks aren't focused asset managers. A final question. Yeah, hi Richard. Um, do, <coughs> I have, how much of your uh, unsecured debt will you have left into next year, next financial year? Yeah, that $100 million unsecured debt is a five-year bullet um, 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 uh, piece of debt. And so we paid back $100 million in four years and a couple of months. What we do, uh, and the business model is, is that the senior debt on the plane is amortised down to zero across an ever-increasing fleet. And in five years' time, we've got a number of choices on how to repay that debt. We can, what typically happens Sorry, as... I mean, how much more capacity have you got? Will you, will you spend that 100 million? Oh, OK. Oh, no, we've, well, as I said, we've sort of added about $275 million worth of planes this year. So we've still got spare capacity to keep growing. And there's other ways that we can... Um, keep growing as well by recycling capital on our balance sheet. We naturally have to sell some old aircraft. And so if you've got $10 million locked up in a, in a plane that you own um, that's 20 years old and you sell it, well, that $20 million will effectively fund about, you know, maybe two or three brand new planes because you leverage those planes up. And, and the other thing you can do is refinance planes because as we amortise our senior debt, we're building up equity in the balance sheet. And by that very function, enables us to refinance planes as well. Obviously, um, shareholders are a source of capital, but we, have, we haven't raised that much money over the last two, you know, I think our last capital raising was two years ago. Um, and we're always looking for alternate sources of capital in what we do. And one of the things about getting scale and getting a better balance sheet is that we've got more banks wanting to lend to us at cheaper rates. And obviously, because we've got the same amount of people, the only other cost in our business is the admin cost. And if you, if you download our annual report, that's flat year on year. And so we really think we're demonstrating that scale and diversification that's setting this company up to do even better in the coming years. Richard, thank you very much.